Hey there, everybody. It is Monday, October 31st, 2022. Happy Halloween, and welcome to another edition of the NFL Fantasy Football Show. It's me, your man, MC Marcus Grant, joined by Michael F. Florio and the specialist cast of Does Yeah! There they are. All in costume today, the specialist. <laughs> the cast of dozens that help us put this show on each and every day, each and every week. And it's Halloween. Did you did you have any fun Halloween weekend hours? I did. I, I went to a Halloween party on Saturday. Uh, we, we're not dressing up today, but I wore a Rick and Morty shirt because I was Rick Sanchez from Rick and Morty and Nicolette was Morty. So uh, it was a fun weekend. How about you? Uh, I'm, I'm old and I'm a dad. So no, I didn't do anything <laughs> at all. Although I'm going to take the kid trick-or-treating tonight. That should be a whole lot of fun. That so seems we'll like fun. Yeah, so we'll see how that goes. By the way, I should mention that this is a show presented by Subway. Try the Subway series menu, your pick of 12 irresistible subs. So we are pretty much through week eight now. We got one more game coming up tonight. That is uh, should be an interesting one, and uh, you know we'll, we'll dive into some other things around week eight of the season. We have the biggest fantasy takeaways, our waiver wire targets, and plus our trick or treat fantasy players so far this season. But let's start with our fantasy headline. There's not a lot in the way of news, but I think it's worth mentioning what Christian McCaffrey did. On Sunday for the 49ers against the Los Angeles Rams. First player with a rushing touchdown, receiving touchdown, and passing touchdown in a single game since LaDainian Tomlinson did it in week six of 2005. The final line for McCaffrey in that game. 18 carries for 94 yards and a touchdown. Nine targets, which he turned into eight catches and 55 yards and a receiving touchdown. And 34 passing yards and a touchdown. That was 40.2 fantasy points there. Obviously, changing scenery has nothing to do with impacting Christian McCaffrey. Now the question is, though, once Debo Samuel gets back and healthy after the bye, how good is this offense going to be? Yeah, I, I know uh, after one week of having them, people were, like, trolling the NFL's post when it was, like, best offense in the league, question mark. But, like, yeah, this I don't know if it'll be the best offense in the league, but it's easily the most talented, I would say. Like, you have a top wide receiver, a top running back, one of the best tight ends in football, and they all bring a unique skill set. And what I loved is, like, I think they could all kind of mesh together. I, I know we might see Debo without, uh, maybe with some less carries, but, like, if we're getting CMC throwing the ball, if he's getting used in the, on the ground and in the pass game, I think it's fine. And I think if we knew CMC would be a 49er, like, if he was a 49er at the start of the year, He's the 101, no doubt. I oh, he's say. hands down the number one overall yeah. pick if we knew he was going to be in San Francisco at the start of the year. So obviously, Kyle Shanahan seems to be doing a pretty good job of meshing all of these players. But we'll wait. The Niners are on a bye this week. Next week, we'll have Christian McCaffrey knowing the full playbook and a healthy Debo Samuel. We have not seen those two things coincide so far this season. So that gets us to our biggest takeaways from Sunday. Florio and I always pool our resources and come up with five things we learned. So for you, what is the first takeaway from this past weekend? I, I don't think this one's a surprise, but the Colts running backs are clearly going to miss Matt Ryan. I, I mean, Matt Ryan every year is up there. It's him or Tom Brady competing for the most passes thrown to the running back position. And then in one game with Sam Ellinger, uh, Jonathan Taylor, one target, no catches. Naheem Hines, two targets targets two catches and that's it typically like a week before Jonathan Taylor had eight targets and seven catches we've seen Deion Jackson have double digit catch week in this backfield so would have been keeping these these Colts running backs afloat because their O-line has been struggling is all of these dump off passes you take that away and now I think you have to be very worried about Jonathan Taylor and I don't know if Naheem Hines is worth rostering let alone starting yeah I think Naheem Hines can go back to the waiver wire at this point and yes Ellinger is not really throwing to his backs after one game and we always worry about that with quarterbacks who are mobile will they throw those dump offs and at least after one game it didn't happen for me Kyle Pitts is just setting you up for more heartbreak. And I know everybody was excited about what we saw. I mean, my Twitter timeline was slot machining when he caught that touchdown on Sunday against the Carolina Panthers. He got some looks, actually had a really good game. And for all the folks who were stubborn enough or steadfast enough, pick your adjective, to keep starting him, congrats, because you did get a good game out of Kyle Pitts. But he also had a lesser target share than in some of his previous weeks. And this is still an offense that's not going to throw the football a whole lot. They're still going to lean heavy on the run. They're going to keep Marcus Mariota under wraps. So there's a very good chance that next week we go back to the same level of Kyle Pitts production we had seen so far. So this was great. I'm glad it happened. We all love Kyle Pitts. We want more from him. 
I'm just not sure that this is going to be him turning a corner and suddenly being the tight end that we want him to be. Agreed. And I, I, I think the approach with Kyle Pitts has to kind of be what the approach with Taysom Hill has been. Like, I understand the floor is very low, but the upside is so high when we're talking tight ends. He's better than a lot of the streaming options. I'll just leave him in there and live with what I get. I think that's, that's kind of the best way to handle it there. What else did you find out from Sunday? Justin Fields has league winning potential here. And I, for all of last year and the first month or so of this season, the bears were really trying to fit a square peg into a round hole, right? Like they were trying to make Justin Fields a pocket passer. And in the last couple of weeks, we've seen more design runs where they're letting him roll out more and throw on the run, which is just where he's more comfortable. He himself has been saying this and it's, I'm so happy the bears are finally designing an offense around their quarterback strengths. But Three straight weeks now with over 60 rushing yards in each game, a rushing touchdown in his last two, over 18 fantasy points in, in three straight, over 23 in his last two. This guy right here, he can be like last year's Jalen Hurts with what he doesn't have to put up huge passing numbers to be a league winner. I just love seeing the designed runs for, for Justin Fields. That makes all the difference in the world, and it seems to open up so many other things in the passing game for the Bears as well. Talking about running, you can start all of your running backs against the Jacksonville Jaguars. And I went into last week thinking that Latavius Murray had some sleeper appeal and Melvin Gordon was probably worth starting. And it turned out they were both decent. I think combined, though, they scored 27 points. If you had formed them into one running back, you would have had maybe a top five running back this week. But I think the point stands that during this recent losing streak that the Jaguars have, which is now five in a row, I believe, they are giving up a ton of yards on the ground and if you have a good running back especially you're, you're starting him but even if you're looking at a guy who's sort of a mid-range guy and you're looking for a sleeper or a flex play you can target the Jacksonville Jaguars their run defense has been bad and there's no signs that it's going to be getting better anytime soon last one what else uh, did you find out this week that Andy Dalton gets the absolute most out of Alvin Kamara. And there's a reason why the Saints have decided to play him over a healthy Jameis Winston. And I think it's because they they can see their offense reverting back to how it was with Drew Brees, which is a lot of dump offs to the running backs and a lot of letting their best playmaker, Alvin Kamara, do what he does in space. In games where Jameis Winston has started this year, uh, Kamara was averaging five and a half targets, two and a half catches, 10 rec yards per game while averaging less than eight and a half fantasy points per game in the three games with Dalton it's 20 and a half fantasy points per game uh, almost over eight targets over six catches and 57 yards re receiving yards per game he's just he's the Alvin Kamara of old with Andy Dalton and he's like a borderline RB2 when it when Jameis Winston starts I'm very curious to see what happens to the Saints offense when and if Michael Thomas comes back and I have mm -hmm. no idea when that's going to yeah. be at this point I mean there's no indication that it's soon but it was nice to see Alvin Kamara look like the guy that we were used to drafting near the top of fantasy drafts uh, in the past few seasons. Time for a break. When we come back, we will dive into the top performers, also some of the guys that maybe let you down in Week 8. That's next on the NFL Fantasy Football Show. Top performers for Week 8, Tua Tungavailoa, nearly 400 passing yards and almost 30 fantasy points there. Alvin Kamara, we talked about, 42.8 fantasy points. Look, Christian McCaffrey had a 40-point day, and he wasn't the top scoring <laughs> running back. That says a lot about what Kamara did. A.J. Brown went bananas, 156 and three touchdowns. That's 39.6. Tyler Conklin doing things again. I haven't seen him in a while, nearly 26 fantasy points there. Nick Folk with 18 points due to five field goals. And the Saints defense, 16 points against the Raiders. You know, I, I actually had a dilemma in one league where I had the Saints defense and the Eagles defense. I, I started the Eagles and they actually had a decent game. They had 14 points, I believe it was, but I, I could have stayed with the Saints and I actually would have uh, had more points. I would say try to trade one, but I don't think anyone's going to No one's going to trade me for a defense. <laughs> that's, that's just not going to happen. Uh, let's talk some of the top performers, though. Deontay Foreman did not make that list of the top scoring player at his position, but it was a big day for Deontay Foreman. And... I'm wondering, even when Chuba Hubbard comes back, what are you doing with Foreman? Is it still worth maybe starting him if you if you need help at running back? Yeah, I, I think right now he is someone that you can get into your starting lineup because of the type of volume that he sees. I do feel bad for him. 32 fantasy points. He's not he's the RB5 on the week. He just <laughs> picked the wrong week to go off. But yes, part of this was that. 
it was against the Atlanta Falcons. I don't think he'll put up this type of production each and every week. But on the show last week, Marcus, I said after this game against the Falcons, I think I'd be looking to sell uh, Deontay Foreman if he had a big game. I still stand by that. But the asking price has definitely gone up a whole lot more than I anticipated. Yeah, I think it definitely has. Now, we'll keep an eye on what Chuba Hubbard's situation is, if he's going to be able to play and, and how that sort of plays into it. But Foreman looks like he's ready to take over that number one running back role there in Carolina. And you're right. Yes, they're, they're not going to play the Falcons every week. But the volume should definitely help. I, I was just peeking at his schedule. I guess it's worth noting that he literally plays the Falcons in two weeks. Ago. Oh, well, there you so. go. So hold on to him. And wait two more weeks. And then, if your trading deadline hasn't hit, then you can try to move him there. Other running backs who had big days, Tony Pollard. And that was one where Fantasy Twitter took a collective victory lap. We were all hand in hand, and we were all popping champagne together. Because every single fantasy analyst was like, start Tony Pollard this week. And it worked out. Three rushing touchdowns against the Bears this past week. But the caveat to this was after the game, Jerry Jones was asked about what the backfield situation was. And essentially he said, we go as Zeke goes, which is to say that once Ezekiel Elliott's healthy, he's going to be back to being the lead running back there. So what does this mean for Tony Pollard? Unfortunately, I, I think it means Tony Pollard is who he kind of has been all year, which is a running back that is going to get his like 10 to 15 touches each week. Uh, he has such high upside because he's so explosive, but there's going to be down weeks where they just give the ball to Zeke more than we want. I, I was hoping that a strong game like this would lead them maybe to at least be like, we need to get Tony Pollard more involved on a weekly basis because he is their most explosive option. I, I, I don't want to say there's no value in what Zeke brings, but what Tony Pollard brings is what a lot of teams are like designing their offenses around. So I, I wish the Cowboys... Uh, would use him more, but hey, they're just keeping him fresh for whoever signs him in this offseason. I guess that's what the, the whole thing is going to be. The one thing I did notice about Pollard is that they still sort of limited his touches. I think they he did. had 15 touches in the game. So even with him being the main running back, they still aren't loading him up with opportunities. And I think that's sort of worth noting. But look, even me as somebody who really has tried to you know, defend Zeke, I looked at what happened yesterday and was like, yeah, Tony Pollard looks good. There was just no way around that at all. DJ Moore has looked good the last two weeks. Uh, last week, he, he had his best fantasy game of the season, and I was like, hey, I think you got to start him this week. He had an even bigger game, six catches for a buck 52 and a touchdown. Also had a penalty that made things a little bit awkward for the Panthers, but that has nothing to do with what he did in fantasy. PJ Walker has been very, very good for him. How are you viewing him now? Wide receiver two? Where, where are you putting DJ Moore? I, I think wide receiver two is a – is the fair place to put him i will say like i still have some concerns just because it's hard for me to shake off what he did in the first half month of the season and, and pj walker has been playing very well but we know pj walker isn't you know a, a top tier quarterback or anything like that but that being said i think we do need to give more a pass on the first month of the season we've seen a coaching change we've seen a quarterback change so while i might not feel as bullish as some people felt about him coming into the year. On the fan, on the teams that I do have him on, I at least feel comfortable being like, I can start this guy either as my wide receiver two or a flex. And not the must-start guy I thought he would be coming in, but much better than what it's been. Yeah, that's, that's my thing. He's not going to be what you thought he was going to be, but he's going to be better than he has been. So it's nice to see P.J. Walker getting him involved, getting him going. And some of it may have to do with the fact that, look, where else are they going with the football, right? No, no Christian McCaffrey, no Robbie Anderson. I know Terrace Marshall Jr. actually made an appearance and, and played well last week. Yeah, he, he's a waiver wire guy, I think, this week. A little bit of a lower name, but right. still someone I, I think you shouldn't take notice of. So, but DJ Moore is back, so I think we can kind of feel more comfortable with him going forward. You saw Tyler Conklin on that board. He had a couple of touchdowns for the New York Jets, and this was a guy that early in the season was very quietly hanging around as like a top five tight end, then he sort of faded. When you look at what happened yesterday, is that Tyler Conklin kind of coming back, or is this just a one-off from, from early in the year? I don't know if it's a, a full one-off, but I'm not – confident trusting Tyler Conklin more than like a boomer bust tight end two. I, I think he's like a high end tight end two each week. It's worth noting that he did have six targets a week ago. So 16 targets in his last two games, nothing to sneeze at, but given who his quarterback is and, and how the Jets offense has operated, I can't tell you like he's a tight end one that you could start each week. He's just, if you need a streaming guy. He's always an option. Talk about the quarterback play. Zach Wilson is an adventure and not in the fun way. It's he, <laughs> there are some throws he makes 
experts like what are you looking at he, man yesterday i was like are, is he like a psych op or whatever for uh, for the <laughs> patriots because he threw two balls solely to a patriot directly defender. to the patriots i was it's amazing so yeah he's he's definitely a work in progress but tyler conklin if you stuck with him or you streamed him congrats to you so those are the guys that did well now to the guys who are a disappointment who let you down this week Ah, <sighs> Mr. Daniel Jones, after I spent all of last week hyping you up and saying how good you've been playing and, and how you've been getting production with your legs, what did you do this week? 176 pass yards, no touchdowns. He rushed for just 20 yards. That has been his low the last couple of weeks. So uh, disappointing. And, and I will give credit to the Seahawks defense. They've been playing much better uh, football the last couple of weeks. They're not a team that you can just pick on as we learned the hard way with Daniel Jones. But I also want to take this second mark. It's just to be like, Richie James, this is also on you a little bit. You up not <laughs> one, but two punts. Come on, what are we doing here? Just be a little bit better next week so Daniel Jones gets more opportunity. Yeah, that was that was a tough one. Although I will say that Adam Rankin, his five guarantees, yeah. also said that Daniel Jones is going to let he, you down. He's going to have fun with that today. I'm he's sure. going to let us know all about that this week. For me, my big disappointment of the week was Devontae Adams just because – I mean, how? How is it that, that he catches one pass for three yards? He only has five targets to begin with, which also seems criminally low. But just not able to connect in a game where the Raider offense was absolutely miserable. You would still think that Derek Carr would find a way to connect with Devontae Adams uh, against a Saints defense that really had been giving up a whole lot of yards through the air recently. But this was this was humongously disappointing. Now, the thing about it is, you know it's Devontae Adams. You know that this is not a thing that's going to happen consistently. You're not going to panic or do anything weird, but it doesn't mean your feelings aren't hurt because you only got <laughs> point, 1.2 points out of him. That's my, what I'm saying. My feeling, as someone who, you know, thought the top stack of the week might be the Raiders, right? Yeah, my feelings were very hurt this week. Okay, well, there, in that case, your feelings <laughs> probably are going to be very hurt this week. That gets us to Rookie Mistakes presented by Snickers. This is when we go to the Twitter machine and we take some of your submissions for some of the things that went wrong in your fantasy lineup. This one from Jimothy342 who says, not starting A.J. Brown. Yeah, I don't feel bad for you. That was on you. Did you not watch the podcast or Fantasy Live? Because Marcus was all over this being the stack of the week all week. I mean, why would you not be starting AJ Brown anyway? Yeah. Like, what, what, what? Who else do you have on your roster that you weren't starting AJ Brown? So I, I have no sympathy for you, Jimothy. That one's completely on you. Uh, let's see what's next. This one from Kylie Maine, scooping up Derek Carr because Mahomes has a bye week. That's, All right, I understand that. That's not on you. I mean, he had a good matchup on yeah. paper. He's been okay this year. That was that one was rough, but that's not your fault. That that just didn't work out for you. Jarrett Stidham came in in relief and scored more fantasy points than Derek Carr. And I, I think it's time where we're like, it, it's Derek. Derek Carr is not a top twelve quarterback, but he. I have a league where like I drafted him as my starter, and mm -hmm. I've been rolling rolling with him most weeks. I don't think I'm going to keep doing that. Yeah, I don't think you can do that. I think I was going to say he's a matchup based starter, but he had the matchup in his favor yeah. yesterday, and it didn't just, it didn't work meh. out. But but don't feel bad. That that's not on you. Next one. Eli, Eli said started Wandale over DK and lost because of it. I don't – here's the thing. I know that DK was questionable, and I was surprised that he was going to play, but once he played, I would have started him over Wandale Robinson. When, when he was up in the air being the later game, I did start in a super flex league. I started Kenny Pickett over him, and I immediately regretted it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, because he caught a touchdown fairly early. He got a lot of targets pretty early, and at this point, man – Geno Smith can really do no wrong. I mean, Tyler Lockett's playing well. DK Metcalf's playing well. Everything's going right for the Seahawks. So I know we were all excited about Wandale, but I don't think I would have started him over DK. Let's see, do we have one more? I think we got one more. Uh, this one from Minka Season. I was without Debo and just lost Brees. I played Brian Robinson and Hunter Renfro, who combined for 3.6 points. Yee. I mean, look... In that situation, you don't have Debo, you lost Brees Hall, you just have to kind of fill in the gaps where you can. So that, you know, that stinks, I get it. But 
you're just doing the best you could with what you had. Is what, that's why I look at it. Yeah, I, I think Hunter Renfro can be dropped yes. now. And uh, Brian, I, I would not trust any commanders running It's back. weird because Antonio Gibson seems to be kind of bouncing back, coming back to life, but not enough that I'm super excited yeah. about him. That's, that's kind of the hard part right there. We still got more to do. We're going to talk about some mid-season fantasy awards. Who are our MVPs? Who are our biggest busts at this point in the year? That's next on the NFL Fantasy Football. The NFL is headed to Germany for the first time. And you could get in on the action. We're sending one lucky fan plus three guests to Munich to watch Tom Brady and the Bucks take on DK Metcalf and the Seahawks. Winning fans will enjoy a week in Munich that also features a Bayern Munich European football match. No purchase necessary. To enter and for rules, visit NFL.com slash Munich sweepstakes. Time to talk some mid-season fantasy awards. We've, we're more than halfway through the fantasy regular season, but this felt like a good time to kind of hand out some fake hardware. So we're going to go through MVP, breakout player, best draft value, and biggest bust. We'll start with MVP, which I know is sort of weird to have your headliner open the show, but we do things differently around here. So for you, who is the most valuable fantasy player at this point in the year? I don't think it's a player who will be taking home his first fantasy MVP award, but I think it's Travis Kelsey. Travis Kelsey right now has already had his bye, meaning that there's a lot of other tight ends that have played an extra game than him. Still, he is the only tight... Uh, Mark Andrews is the only other tight end to top 100 fantasy points on the year, whereas Travis Kelsey's almost at 150. Like, he gives you such an advantage at the thinnest position in the game. And what I love is his ADP was lower this year than it's been in years. So you got him at a discount and you're still getting the same old Travis Kelsey tight end one production. The Travis Kelsey's been amazing. Maybe not worth that first round pick that we talked about a couple years ago, but he has been just a huge advantage for anybody. For me, it's Austin Eckler. And it's because... We look at a lot of the early first round picks or a lot of the first round picks in general, especially at the running back position, and so many of them have been disappointing. If you spent the number one overall pick on Jonathan Taylor, if you took a, a high round pick on somebody like Najee Harris, these guys have really let you down. Austin Eckler has not. You see the 25 fantasy points per game this season, the most among running backs, and yes, he had a down first few weeks of the season when he didn't get in the end zone and people were wondering what's wrong. Since then, it has been go mode all the time for Austin Eckler. He's running the ball effectively. He's catching the ball super effectively. He's finding the end zone on a regular basis. And so if you actually spend an early round pick on Austin Eckler, you have gotten your return on investment and then some. And I think right now with people struggling to find consistency at running back, that makes Eckler a strong MVP candidate. Over to the breakout player of the year so far. And we've got a lot of good options, especially at running back, especially among young running backs. Who is your pick? Yeah, I thought it might be cheating to grab a rookie running back, but I I'm going to go with Kenneth Walker here. I, I know he's coming off of a down day by his standards, but he has been so good. He was the RB9 uh, since he became the starter coming into this week. I know that last yesterday, again, was a little bit of a disappointment, but given the amount of snaps carries yards that this guy has been seeing each and every week i again i we keep saying it marcus it's no longer a question of if he's an rb1 it's just really a question of like how many rbs can we realistically say we would take over and even with the down day he still found the end zone late which yeah. made it for a pretty good day nonetheless i'm gonna go with the guy who's not actually a rookie but functionally he kind of is and that's travis etn and I thought it was going to be a lot of ETN early with James Robinson closing the gap. Instead, it went the other way, where it was Robinson early, and ETN had not only closed the gap but surpassed him to the point that the Jaguars felt like Robinson was expendable and traded him to the New York Jets. ETN has been amazing, 100 or more scrimmage yards in four straight games. And you, know, you listen to him talk, he says he's just scratching the surface of what he can do. The Jaguars still a work in progress as a team, but it does look like they have hit on something in the backfield with Travis ETN. He has been beyond what I expected this year, and I think you're going to be talking about him as a first-round pick yeah. next year for sure. That gets us to our best draft value this season. Who do you have? 
a boring veteran that no one seemingly wanted on their fantasy teams this year, Tyler Lockett. Like, DK Metcalf, you were still having to pay close to full price to get him despite the quarterback change from Russell Wilson to Geno Smith. Tyler Lockett, though, was going like outside the top 40 wide receivers, and here we are halfway through the season. He's the wide receiver 11 on the year. Since week two, he has one game in single digit fantasy points. Like he is so consistent each week. He still brings a high ceiling. He's still getting used uh, in the red zone as one of their top targets. And what I love about this offense is they are funneling everything through their top two playmakers and it's making a huge difference. Tyler Lockett is still the fantasy asset that he has been and he was way cheaper than ever. Yeah, I drafted Tyler Lockett in quite a few spots, mostly because he kept falling down draft afterwards and I was like okay look I get it I have concerns too but he's still a good player so why not draft him for me it's gonna be Josh Jacobs it's another boring veteran that people didn't want on their fantasy teams and that turns out to be a mistake Josh Jacobs we were really worried when at the Hall of Fame game he got like 11 billion snaps and got all these carries like what are the Raiders doing are they trying to trade him no apparently they were just making sure that he could handle a solid workload because he's been amazing this year the true RB1 there in Las Vegas right now he is the running back five and this is a guy that was slipping to the sixth seventh round of a lot of drafts because people were like I don't want Josh Jacobs well turns out we were wrong about that one so anybody who had Jacobs fall into their lap has had an amazing, amazing running back so far this season. That gets us to the biggest bust. And for you, who's the guy that you're regretting drafting right this, now? This one pains me to say because he was my guy last year, but Jonathan Taylor, who was the unquestioned 101 in many drafts. I know some people were like him or CMC, but the consensus was Jonathan Taylor first overall pick this year. He's the RB32 on the year right now in total points. I know he's missed time due to injury. He has topped 15 fantasy points once since week two. Right now, some running backs that have scored more than him on the year, Michael Carter, Jeff Wilson, James Robinson, Raheem Mostert. Khalil Herbert is averaging more fantasy points per game right now than Jonathan Taylor. And it's going from... It's just getting worse, I would say, because we opened the show talking about the lack of targets going to the running back. He hasn't scored a touchdown, I think, in like seven weeks or something like that. Like, this is a guy who scored 20 last year. The Colts O-line isn't what it was. You, you got to ride out with Jonathan Taylor. You got to start him. But, man, it's it's gone bad quick for him. The volume is going to be there. The talent is certainly there. But the offense has really crumbled around him. So it, it might be a tough slog the rest of the way for Jonathan Taylor. Mine is Najee Harris. And this is another guy that we were talking about as an easy first-round pick, maybe even top five, depending on your league or how you felt about him. I had concerns. I was wondering what the target share was going to be without Ben Roethlisberger. And that's been a huge drop-off right there. He's getting about half the targets as he was at the same time last season. So certainly not getting those cheap, quick fantasy points just in the PPR sense. But on top of it, the Steelers offense is one of the worst in the National Football League. They're not moving the ball. They're not scoring points. Harris has been inconsistent and unproductive as a runner. And now we're starting to see more Jalen Warren work in there. So part of what we loved about Najee Harris is that he was dominating the snap share. That's not the case anymore either. And with the Steelers not looking like they're going to make a huge improvement anytime soon, I don't know that Najee Harris is going to be the player that you spent an early round draft pick on. That is going to be super frustrating for a whole lot of people. What's going to be frustrating is that we had six teams on a bye this week, so that means you're going to have to dive into the waiver wire. We will help you with that next on the NFL Fantasy Football Show. It's time for Refresh Your Lineup, presented by Subway. Let's look at some of the waiver wire targets heading into week nine. Florio, who's on the list? Justin Fields, who we spoke about earlier, saying he is league-winning upside. Also, Marcus Mariota, just because he consistently has been giving production with his legs, and he gets a team that you can run on next week at some running backs. Kenyon Drake, because Gus Edwards uh, suffered another injury. We got to monitor that situation. Latavius Murray, who I know is on by this week, but continues to split the backfield with Melvin Gordon. Ronnie Rivers, as long as the Rams don't make a trade for a running back, he's an option. And so is Justice Hill, just again, because Gus Edwards was limited and missed some time last week at receiver. Rondell Moore, who's looking like a flex option until Marquise Brown returns. Allen Robinson and Van Jefferson, uh, who returned this past week just because Cooper Cup left with an ankle injury. Darius Slayton, who's been getting more and more volume there. Julio Jones, who, you know, he returned to our fantasy lives this past week. Terrace Marshall Jr. getting a lot of end zone looks there for P.J. Walker and the Panthers. And then a lot of tight ends. 
Evan Ingram continues to be a thing, as is Greg Dolchik. I will take the L on Mike Gusecki. I didn't believe it <laughs> this past week, and he caught a touchdown, making him fantasy viable. And then Isaiah Likely, it, it's a little bit tough. It's an extended week on a Monday night, but... Mark Andrews did lead the game last week, so likely he's in play if Andrews misses time. Yeah, keep an eye on, on Mark Andrews because that will determine how valuable Isaiah likely is. And by the way, Mike Gasicki, thank you for not doing the gritty after you scored your touchdown. <laughs> America thanks you for that. Uh, by the way, six teams on a bye this week. The Browns, the Cowboys, the Broncos, the Giants, the Steelers, and the 49ers. So chances are you are going to be missing some players, so the waiver wire is going to be super important. By the way, if you want more information you want more insight on some of these guys you can go check out matt okada's waiver wire column it's nfl.com slash waiver wire matt does a great job with that every single week let's talk some of these top targets justin fields we talked about him a little bit uh, lately or we talked about him a little bit earlier in the show i should say is he i won't say a qb1 but is he where do you have him ranked in terms of, of quarterbacks going forward i i think he's in play almost like obviously Allen Lamar hurts Mahomes Burrow I'd still put Kyler over him um but after that like that's six quarterbacks and after that I think Justin Fields deserves to be in the conversation like him versus Gino I think is a legit discussion him versus Daniel Jones uh like Kirk Cousins quarterback just isn't as deep as we thought it would be so given that and given that a lot of people are getting like 15 points per game or something like that out of the position Fields has so much more upside than that. I, I don't think it's crazy to call him a QB1. Latavius Murray, you had on the list, uh, mentioned that he is on a bye this week with people trying to find running backs worth a stash at this point? I think so. Like, I, I started him in a league this past week. He gave me 12 fantasy points. I, I was very satisfied with that. And obviously, yeah, half of that came from a touchdown. But that's kind of what you're expecting when you start Latavius Murray. Right, exactly. You're, you're not going to get a ton of rushing yards because he's still splitting time with Melvin Gordon. And even when they had Mike Boone healthy, and it was a three-headed attack. It was pretty much just two guys getting most of the work, and the third guy was sort of the odd man out there. Allen Robinson, the Rams did not win, but Allen Robinson saw, I think, more targets and more catches than I remember seeing in a game from him all season long. How do we feel? Are we feeling like maybe he's back? He's, he's not going to be back to the Allen Robinson from a few years ago, but is he more viable now? I, I think... I'm willing to pick up Allen Robinson and see if he can build off of this. Like one of his targets was an end zone fade because I'm pretty sure Sean McVay thinks that's the only route Allen Robinson can run. <laughs> um, but I, I think it was encouraging, worth taking a shot on, worth picking up. I, I want to see him do it again. If Cooper Cup misses the week, I think then that you have to reevaluate everything. But if Cooper Cup plays, I think I take more of a wait and see approach. With I just, I, you know, I, I, at least maybe, as you said, pick him up, hold on to him, see how things go before you put him in your lineup. But it was encouraging to see them using him between the 20s and not strictly as an end zone fade guy. We're always looking for more tight ends. Greg Dulcich has stepped in since coming off injured reserve, and he's immediately been a top target for Russell Wilson. Are you willing to say he's a fringe tight end one? And I say fringe tight end one because that's a huge category. It probably includes <laughs> like 20 guys. But does he slide into those 20 guys as a fringe tight end one? Yeah, I, I don't think, you know, he's not in the, the group of like the Ertz and the Goddards and the Schultz, which those are like the secondary tier of tight ends. But you feel comfortable using them most weeks. He's more like that Evan Ingram, like even Kyle Pitts tier, I'll say, where like you don't feel great every week about what their production might be. But they see enough volume that they're always kind of like a Tyler Conklin, I would say, like sees enough work where he's not a must start each week, but he's always in play as a streaming option. I had a little bit of a heart palpitation when you said Kyle Pitts was down in that, uh, oh, that lower range. It mm. hurts so much. So sad. So if you're adding people, you're probably going to have to drop some people. Who are a couple guys that you can say goodbye to now? Elijah Moore, who not only is he, you know, not playing much anymore. He played 10 snaps yesterday. Like, what are we doing? He's also publicly, like, they asked him about his chemistry on the field with Zach Wilson. <laughs> and he was like, I don't know, man. I don't get the ball. That's all you need. To, I, and I will add this one caveat, though. Waivers run Tuesday night. The trade deadline is Tuesday afternoon. If Elijah Moore is traded, then everything changes. But if he is still on the Jets uh, when you go to put your waivers in Tuesday night, you can drop him. Same thing with J.D. McKissick because Brian Robinson is getting the most of the 
carries, whereas McKissick we thought would get the targets, but Antonio Gibson is eating into the carries of Brian Robinson, the targets of J.D. McKissick, and if you have three running backs, it's an absolute nightmare. I don't want any of them for fantasy, so J.D. McKissick, I think, sadly, is someone that you can drop. Well, you talk about having three running backs, and that's the case with the Rams, which is why Daryl Henderson can probably go back on the waiver wire. I know he was dealing with an illness a little bit on Sunday, and that might have impacted some of his opportunities, but Ronnie Rivers was the guy who got the start. Malcolm Brown came in at some point and got some opportunities. Cam Akers technically is still a Ram. We'll see what happens if they're able to move him by the trade deadline. But if they're not, you know, who knows if they try to integrate him back into the offense as well. Either way, the Rams just cannot open holes running the football. That's why you saw a lot of jet, stri- jet sweeps, a lot of screens, just trying to manufacture some kind of running game. Either way, Daryl Henderson, not productive enough to hold on to. The other one is Josh Reynolds. Because what we liked about Josh Reynolds was getting that target share, but it was also when there were some guys missing. Amon Ross St. Brown is back, and he's healthy now. TJ Hawkinson is there, and DeAndre Swift is back, who's going to occupy a pretty good target share as well. We've also seen Jamal Williams getting work. There's just too many mouths to feed right now for Josh Reynolds to be on your roster, especially when wide receiver is so deep across the fantasy landscape. It is Halloween, which means there's going to be some folks out trick-or-treating tonight. We're going to do our own little trick-or-treating. That's coming up next as we wrap it up on the NFL Fantasy Football Show. Let's do some trick-or-treating, shall we? We got a list of seven players here, and we're going to decide whether or not that player will be a trick or a treat for the remainder of the season. So let's start at quarterback with Jared Goff. Started the year hot, hit a rough patch, was okay on Sunday. So for Goff, trick or treat for the rest of the year. He's a trick. Uh, unfortunately, it looks like he might be one of those quarterbacks that kind of break out and, and puts up good numbers despite being in a poor situation. I, I think now, like, Goff didn't take huge advantage of this great matchup against Miami. To me, he is more of just a quarterback that you could stream in the right matchup in the right weeks but nothing more than that i I think we've seen you know jared goff reverting to being who jared goff is which means i think he is a trick for the rest of the season as you said there will be some days where it's decent but a lot of times he's just he's still a check down guy Uh, even though the lions are scoring points a lot of it coming through the running back so i'm not big on jared goff we talked about the commander's backfield and Brian Robinson kind of working in, but Antonio Gibson coming to life, had a nice day on Sunday. Is Gibson a trick or treat for the rest of the year? I think Gibson is a trick still. He can become a treat if his targets continue to go up. I will give him credit. He's seen at least four targets in four straight games, but when you're getting single digit carries and like around four targets, it's hard to be a consistent fantasy option. So I think Gibson, while there's some upside there, right now he's taking away more from Brian Robinson and JD McKissick than he is getting enough to be a weekly asset in his own right. I want to say he's a treat, but he's that treat that you get left over at the bottom of the bag where like everything else is gone and you just, you just need something sweet and you're like, all right, fine. But with three running backs, there occupying space in Washington. It's hard for him to be consistently productive. So I'm going to give him a treat treat status but it's you know it's it's milk duds or something like that but i i like milk duds always take like they, 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 they catch a lot of strays yeah like they were in a pinata that got broken and everyone was like oh we could leave the milk duds i was like i'll, I'll take the milk duds like <laughs> I, I like them okay um junior mints do, do you like whoppers they're fine they're also another candy that that was like people were just leaving them. they're they're, they're fine like, oh. i don't i don't dislike them i don't gravitate toward them so anyway <laughs> uh deandre swift who came out of the box hot Got hurt, came back, and was just meh, 14 points on Sunday. But DeAndre Swift, trick or treat? I still think DeAndre Swift is a treat. I I know he disappointed this past week, and I know Jamal Williams taking away all the goal line work. It is going to be a headache that we're just simply not going to get rid of this year. That is how the Lions backfield operates. But still, Swift is so explosive that I I think he'll get his normal workload moving forward. And on that, even if he's giving away some of his touchdowns, he's so explosive that you start him every week. This is an easy treat for me because of the target share he gets, and I do think he's going to get... More carries. I see the eight per game this season. I still think there's going to be more opportunities for him to touch the football. And he's a guy that because he catches the ball, isn't necessarily game script dependent. So I think there are better days coming for DeAndre Swift. He's going to score touchdowns. I think he's going to be fine. He is a treat the rest of the way for me. 
David Montgomery is a guy that I liked. I know a lot of folks were sort of off David Montgomery. I'm still clinging to that desperately. But it's getting harder with Khalil Herbert getting more opportunities. So trick or treat for David Montgomery. Much like you had Antonio Gibson as like a bottom of the bag treat. That, mm-hmm. That's what David Montgomery – like he's like peeps or something like oh. that right now. Like yeah. not good, but if you need your sugar – I mean not even that, – that's too low for him. <laughs> but like I don't know. I'm one of those people that like if I need candy, even if it's a candy I don't like, I, I'm willing to eat it. That's kind of what David Montgomery is right now. Like – he still is going to get enough volume each week where he's always in play, but Khalil Herbert's taking a bunch of carries away and some targets. Now with Justin Fields getting more design runs, two weeks in a row at the red zone touchdown going towards Fields, it has lowered Montgomery's floor to being single digits, I think, but there's still enough weekly upside where he's always going to tempt you. Tootsie Rolls, how do you feel about that? I like Tootsie Rolls, but that's a good example. Like, yeah. they're not great. Right, and I think, that's, I think that's what David Montgomery is right now. He's, he's Tootsie Rolls. I still like him. I still think he's going to get good opportunity. He'll score some touchdowns. But Khalil Herbert is in there, and on top of it, Justin Fields taking a lot of those rushing attempts, too, really sort of dampens his value a little bit. But I'm not willing to completely give up on Montgomery because he's still the lead running back there in Chicago. Cortland Sutton, we've talked over and over again about the struggles of the Broncos defense. And lately, it's Jerry Judy getting a whole lot more opportunity there in Denver. So Cortland Sutton, trick or treat? He is in a similar sort of treat. Like, he's the candy that you're like, eh, I don't really like this. But come, like, November 16th, when I need my sugar fix, I'm happy I still have it there. That's what I think of Cortland Sutton. I don't think he's a player that you want to start each and every week, but I don't think I think there's enough upside there with, with him and, and still some there with Russ that you want him on your roster just in case, but he is no longer a must-start guy. Yeah, I'll give him like an Almond Joy kind of status. Like, I like I like Almond Joys. I like, the, uh, I like the coconut, but I don't always love it all the time. So I think Cortland Sutton's a guy that some weeks is going to be really good for you, some weeks probably not. It may be frustrating to figure out when and where, but the target share is going to be there. So I think that's what's hard to kind of – get him out of your lineup or certainly off your roster it's just going to be frustrating there Rondale Moore you had him in the waiver wire there we know Nuke Hopkins is back Marquise Brown's coming back trick-or-treat for Rondale I I think he is a treat until Marquise Brown returns once Marquise Brown returns then I think Rondale Moore probably goes back to being a waiver wire guy Uh, but eight targets in three of his last four games is worth noting and what I did like uh, was yesterday he got used more in the slot which is clearly where he is at his best um, I, I thought the week prior that like they don't care about Rondo more because they're building everything around D-Hop, and they still are, but they did line D-Hop out wide more. Uh, Rondo Moore is explosive. I think that's who he is at this point. Like He's like a flex guy that brings you a high upside, but not the same. Right. He's he's sort of like a baked good or whatever. That only lasts so, for so long. You're that's just a candy get stale. I don't like. Yeah, you don't you don't the, like baked, baked beans or yeah, whatever. Yeah, not a, not a fan. Yeah, of not a really fan of baked beans either. But he's a guy that you know it only lasts so long. The shelf life is short here because once Marquise Brown comes back, then it's going to be hard for Moore to get a significant target share, and it's going to be frustrating there uh, to use him. Last one, George Kittle caught a touchdown yesterday. Caught one last week as well for National Tight End Day. But the usage is still going to be frustrating. So now, especially with Christian McCaffrey there, George Kittle, is he a trick or a treat? I think he is once again a treat. And I think part of why we were so low on George Kittle early on is because the offense looked a lot different with Trey Lance. Like in those two first weeks, he had nine targets. Since then, uh, the targets have gone up. Five was his high in the first two weeks with Lance. That has been his low in the last month with Jimmy G. Two games of nine or more targets. He's also a tight end, and he brings more upside than most tight ends not named Mark Andrews or Travis Kelsey. So he's always a treat. Yeah, he's 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 like a hundred grand bar, right? Which you don't find them very often. You don't see them around, but when you have them, like you get them because they're really really good. And that's sort of George Kittle is that you don't know what you're going to get from him week to week, but when when he's on, the production is good, as you mentioned. Tight end, we are we're just thirsty for anybody that can give you some consistent production. So look, I think you're starting George Kittle most weeks and you just hope that it's not a week where Kyle Shanahan is asking him to be a de facto sixth lineman. But when he gives you games like we saw yesterday against the Rams, it's not bad for George Kittle. Uh, we actually have time for one more bonus one. So let's go Romeo Ooh. Dobbs who it was, it was sort of like Aaron Rodgers was subtweeting him during the week last week, and then he came out, had a decent game, had a really nice touchdown catch against the Bills. So for the rest of the year, trick or treat for Romeo Dobbs? He is a treat 
but in the sense of like we kind of know what this treat is already. Like I, I, there is more untapped upside there just because like he is capable of making plays like he did last night. And I wish that Aaron Rodgers and the Packers offense would take more shots downfield, particularly to Dobbs. But I think he's going to be up and down because this that's just he's a rookie fourth round pick and they're putting a lot on his plate. So there will be very high highs, but there will be low lows as well. Yeah, I mean, I think he's, I think you have it right. I think he's a treat in the sense of you understand what it is. He's like those little you know, wrapped peppermint or butterscotch candies that usually your grandparents have at their house sitting on the coffee table or something like that. So, like, you know, it's fine, but it's not going to be spectacular and, and it's not going to be something that you want all the time. And the Packer offense has just been so disappointing this year that I think it's hard to get anything consistent out of Romeo Dobbs. The excitement that we had for him in August has definitely dwindled significantly now that we're yeah. in October. So it's fine, but it's nothing really to get, get super excited about. What we do have to get excited about, though, is the fact that we've got fantasy content five days a week in your podcast feed. You can subscribe to any one of our shows, and you'll get all five of them. That's this show. That's the Q&A show. That's the Stardom sit -em show. And you can also catch these shows in the NFL Fantasy app, the NFL Fast Channels, and YouTube.com slash NFL Fantasy Football. By the way, you can always send us questions on the Twitter machine at NFL Fantasy. We try to answer some where we can. The rest of them we hand over to Aaron because he doesn't like cabbage. So just a rem <laughs> reminder, though, you can have fantasy content every day of the week, at least every weekday of the week. Uh, just subscribe to any one of our shows here. In the meantime, for this show, that is it. We are done. We appreciate you hanging out with the NFL Fantasy Football Show presented by Subway. Try the Subway Series menu, your pick of 12 irresistible subs. You know the drill. Tell two friends to tell two friends. Rate, review, and remember, they say motivation doesn't last. Then again, neither does bathing. Be safe, take care of yourselves, and we will talk to you on Wednesday. Happy Halloween, everybody.